This area represents both the historic and ecological conditions Sandy Delta started with when it became public land in the 90s. Ecologically, we're in between a bunch of different zones, the Columbia Gorge on one end, the Lower Columbia on one end, the Sandy River and Mount Hood, all converging here, giving us this unique blending of both ecological and social conditions that we need to work with. Here's another example of the challenges we face at the Sandy Delta because these are areas that we've begun to be planting, but you see the dry conditions start to have their impact. Some of this plant is still alive, but a lot of it's getting scorched just because of the exposure, the, uh, the, the, the bare ground and the lack of cover. Whereas in this area over here, it's got the shade of a naturally occurring oak. This is one of the granddaddies around here. And then beneath that oak, when you've got some canopy and some cover, you see a healthy range of native shrubs and, and understory because it's in some shade. When historic conditions removed all the forest from areas like this, it changed the landscape in ways that we need to restore before the whole habitat can recover its true function. This is one of the few historic sites that we know golden paintbrush used to occur at in Oregon. Because of land use changes, invasive weeds, and, and urbanization, many populations have been lost. The other rare species we're talking about is Nelson's checker mallow. And that's um, a species that's listed as threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But we'll need to find wetter sites for that species than where we are here, for example. This is very dry compared to where the, the Nelson's checker mallow will thrive. But you've got a lot of wet spots. You've got swales and, and areas that lead down to the river and backwaters, and so you've got, you've got a lot of opportunity. Yeah, so we were, we were talking about these trees that have been planted. These are mostly hawthorns, but a few other things. And many of them have died, as you can see. And they've only died in the last few weeks as the summer conditions have dried out. And the challenge they have is that the soils are so well-drained, so droughty, that as the summer conditions uh, hit us, there's just not enough moisture retained in the soil to keep them alive. But it's a good thing they're planted in a long belt because you can at least see some places where they, they do, uh, they're still alive and, and they will, may survive the whole summer. But this particular belt right in here, you can see we've had high mortality. And so um, it just suggests this is really a hard place to get these kinds of uh, plants to grow. You know, strategies for dealing with that might be to get plants with even deeper root stock so you can get them down to where there is some moisture. But it may be that these are just, this is just a very difficult place to get woody vegetation to establish. It's an opportunity to be thinking about, well, how do you do contingency planning when you're trying to restore an area and you're just not sure how the plants you're planting are gonna respond? Plan to plant more than once because any given year might be very difficult for plants to survive and like we're experiencing now. Despite the fact we had like a record cold, wet spring, that didn't carry through till now. Now we're, we're experiencing triple digit heat. Um, other things you can do are, are plant high diversity of, of plants so that some of the species may be able to tolerate uh, the difficult conditions that you experience in the summer better than others. But you don't necessarily know which those are going to be. So you just plant a lot of different kinds of things. Now, these trees may have done a little better if the competing grass had been removed first because that grass is absorbing water out of the soil also. Always think it's an experiment uh, so that you can learn as you go and get better as you go. And of course, if it was just a good year, you might as well take credit for that and pat yourself on the back because some of this is, is about morale, right? Keeping your spirits up and, and moving towards that. Now we know how to do it, uh, even though uh, maybe next year that same technique won't work as well. Uh, but then you learn that. It's like, oh, well, we know it worked in some years, and this is the kind of year it worked. And this other kind of year, uh, maybe not so much. This particular site might actually work pretty well for Nelson's checker mallow. It's a wetland plant. Uh, and it, it, it'll need to have its feet wet basically through the winter until we get to June or so. Then if the soils dry out, that's okay. The tall grass in the background right here and across the, the pond is called reed canary grass. And uh, it's very competitive, it has thick, thick root system. 
And so that's, in a sense, incompatible with planting Nelson's checker mallow. Picking out exactly where, kind of in the, the bathtub ring around this pond, will be the best place for Nelson's checker mallow is, is hard to know um, at the outset. The way to figure it out is to plant the plants along a gradient, kind of from the high area down to the low area, even across and up the other side, and do that in multiple places uh, you know, across this, this pond. And then come back in a year, two years, and see where the plants have survived, how they are doing in terms of reproduction. Are they making flowers? Are those flowers making seeds? And then over a few years, are those seeds landing on the ground and making seedlings? And then you really know where they're, they're gonna grow well. Uh, so you could add more and expand the population or manage what you've got if enough survived to uh, make sure that the reed canary grass, for example, doesn't come back in and, and um, kind of destroy the habitat quality for the, for the Nelson's checker mallow. But that's, that's one approach you can take in, in uh, figuring out, you know, what, where's the, uh, the best hydrology for the Goldilocks of plants that, that want it not too wet and not too dry, but just right. As diversity of the habitat goes up, the diversity of other organisms goes up also. And for humans, we're attracted in general to areas with high diversity, with lots of flowers, lots of different kinds. We, we appreciate that. I don't know if that's uh, intuitive or somehow innate in us, but uh, we, we often are attracted to that. And so we'll get more of that here if we can restore this to that kind of condition. So the project for us has been to come in with a lot of partners, uh, with a lot of hard work to clear out the blackberries and the other weeds and to bring back some of the native forest and understory plants that fish, wildlife, birds, amphibians, all of these living creatures that would use the delta need to be healthy.